and good evening to each of you. We're very glad to welcome you tonight as we continue on in our study of the book of Revelation. And uh, we're looking uh, at the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation this evening. Uh, we have just finished talking about the trumpets, and we have covered in this particular series, we've covered the seals, uh, we've taken a look now at the trumpets, and so we hope that that has helped you put a section of the book of Revelation together and uh, as we continue. But tonight, we go to Revelation 12, the war in heaven. It's what we'll be looking at as we start. And so you find that the book of Revelation has different sections in it, and we cover those sections one at a time, and we, as you study them, you'll see how that God opens things up and you'll understand it more and more. Our next series that we'll be doing is entitled The Three Angels' Messages. Three Angels' Messages. And we're going to be looking at Revelation 13 through 16. That's what we'll be looking at, Revelation 13 through 16 in our next series as we talk about the Three Angels' Messages very, very important messages that God has for the world. And so, uh, we look forward to doing that series with you, and we hope that it'll continue uh, to help you grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Thank you very much for tuning in. Those of you that are watching by television or listening on the radio or uh, following on the Internet, uh, we hope that as we are talking about these different events that take place in Revelation, that it's opening up the book because God intends for you to understand it because it is the revelation. That is, means the revealing of God's Word. And He promises to bless you if you read it and study it. So we hope that it's helping you do that as we've taken a look at the book of Revelation. Uh, we're very pleased, always thankful and enjoy having uh, Pam and Jimmy Rhodes with us. They're always a great, great blessing, and they just minister to my heart in a special way. Pam's going to sing for us tonight a song entitled, Look For Me, and I'm sure you'll be blessed as she sings that. Chuck Algar is going to read to you the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, and so follow along as he reads that to you. And then Pam will sing for us. Good evening. If you have your Bibles tonight, let's took, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 17. Revelation, chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. Let's read together. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail threw, drew a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them for our God day and night, has been cast down. 
And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil hath come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he hath a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, in times, in a half a time, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. May God add his blessing to his word. When you finally make your entrance to that city With jasper walls and bright gold avenues As you behold, oh it's beauty So much to view. 
bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to see God's praise than Our Heavenly Father, as we consider that you're making provisions for each one of us to be in your kingdom, that we'll have the privilege of living throughout eternity, we just want to give you, Lord, our thanks, our love, ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be with us tonight. Give us the understanding that we need. May we grasp the conflict that's taking place. And may we place ourselves squarely upon the side of Jesus Christ and reach out, Lord, and take hold of your hand and walk with you by faith all the way into the kingdom of heaven. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Revelation, the 12th chapter, War in Heaven. When we come to this 12th chapter, this begins kind of a new uh, sequence. Uh, we have looked at the seven churches, taking us from the early church, to clear to the coming of Jesus Christ. Then we picked up with the fourth chapter, and it started talking about the uh, throne of God, and then it picks up with the seven seals, starting again with the early church, and this whole series that we've looked at has taken us clear up to the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. Now, here with this chapter... Uh, we start a new series that will focus on the end-time events and then will take us to the coming of Jesus Christ again. So this is what we're beginning with this chapter 12 of Revelation. The 12th chapter of Revelation basically is divided into three parts. So as you read that chapter and study it, you need to make notes and put it down that it's divided into three parts. The three parts are simply this. Verses 1 to 6 is one part. And then verse 7 through 12 is another part. And verses 13 through 17 is another part. And we'll look at that tonight. That's the way the 12th chapter is divided up. And we'll take a look and see what it tells us about it. But we hope that it'll give you an overall view because that's what he's trying to do is give you an overall view of the conflict that has taken place between Christ and Satan. So, let's start and take a look at verses 1 through 6. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. 
And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So here he's describing the woman. Now what, he, what we're having happen here, folks, is he is just using the woman here to represent the church and coming and carrying God's people into this next section. That's what's happened. For in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This is his church. He goes on and says here, as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The woman represents God's church. And so he's talking about this woman, and he's talking about the conflict that's going to go on between her and a great red dragon. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her. So here you have the church represented as a woman. This woman is clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet. On her head is a garland of 12 stars. Okay? And it says that this woman is there. She is blessed by God in a special way. The moon under her feet represents the Old Testament time that she's coming out of. Being clothed with the sun represents the gospel of Jesus Christ in all of its beauty and basically dims, fades out the old or the moon because of the brightness of the sun. And then it says she has a garland of 12 stars on her head. That represents the 12 tribes that we're talking about and also the 12 apostles. And so you have that transfer the Scripture's making from the Old Testament period into the New Testament period is what is happening here. But she's not the only character here. All of a sudden, he tells us that there is a great red dragon. This great red dragon is in conflict with the woman. Doesn't like the woman basically wants to do away with her. And so the Scripture says, So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Please notice that it refers to the devil as the what? As the what? as the dragon. Put that down, because from this point on, through the, through the 20th chapter of Revelation, it will refer to the dragon over and over and over again. So you need to be aware that the dragon is the devil, Satan. And he, like I said, isn't happy with the woman. This dragon has... Uh, seven heads and ten horns on it. Those ten horns you will find mentioned time and time again in Scripture. They're mentioned in Daniel, the seventh chapter. The beast there had ten horns. You'll find this beast has ten horns. You'll find that the one we're going to be studying in Revelation 13 has ten horns. The one in Revelation 17 has ten horns. Those ten horns have meaning, particularly in the last days. And we're going to be looking at that in one of our studies about these ten kings. Very important. The seven heads on this dragon represents the different nations down through time that have been in opposition to God's people. 
And that's who they represent. We'll talk more about those as we take a look at it. But this is the dragon. And here in Daniel 7, it says, was different from all the beasts that before it had ten horns. These ten horns are the same, identical all the way through. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. Okay? His tail did what? Drew a third of the stars of heaven. And in our study of the trumpets, it talks about that their tail did what? Had stings in it and so forth. You see, the tail here in Scripture is used representing power, which he had. And it says, with that, he drew a third of them to the earth. Stars of heaven drew them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She's pregnant, about ready to give birth. And the dragon is there ready to devour the child as soon as it is born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So it tells us that she gave birth to a male child. And it, then it gives characteristics of that child. It says, one, he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and he was caught up to God and to his throne. And we know very clearly from the Christmas story exactly what that's about because you remember the wise men who made their way to uh, Jerusalem. You remember they got there. They inquired of the Christ child, but uh, couldn't find anything out. They inquired all over the city. In fact, it says it upset the whole city. So much so that Herod called them in and asked them who they were looking for. And they said, well, we're looking for this child that's to be born a king. Well, of course, that was very interesting to Herod because he didn't want any competition. And so he told them, he called in the scribes and said, where's this child to be born? And they said, oh, he's to be born down in Bethlehem. Always amazing to me. Stop and think about it. Here, these are the scribes. These are the, the students of God's Word, and they knew exactly where he was to be born, but they didn't bother to go take a look. Now, I've never quite been able to put that together. But anyhow, those wise men followed that star around down to Bethlehem, and there they found the child, and they worshiped him. They gave him their gold and their myrrh and their frankincense, and they worshiped the child. And then it says that this child was to be caught up to God and to his throne. You remember, Herod told them to come back and tell him when they had found the child. And it says that an angel told those wise men to go back home a different way. And they went back home a different way, and when Herod found out he had not been told, he had all the children, two years of age and under, male children, in Bethlehem killed. But this child, and there's only been one child that's ever been born that was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and was caught up to God and to his throne, and that child was Jesus Christ, only one that's ever been born to fulfill that prophecy. But watch carefully. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So this woman, who the dragon is persecuting, has fled into the wilderness. And it says that she would be there for 1,260 days. Now, that's not something you haven't seen. Because we have looked at that time sequence several times in our study together. We found out in Ezekiel 4, 6 that a day represents what? Year. One year in Bible prophecy. A day represents a year. So we have here that she was going to flee into the wilderness for a time, time and a half a time, which comes out as 1,260 years. And so she was to be in the wilderness for 1,260 years, this woman. This is the time that she was to be in the wilderness. This is what the uh, first six verses of Revelation talks about, folks, and all. 
Okay, notice verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Now, the scene is completely changed. It's changed from that. Now, all of a sudden, we're looking at a different scene, and it says war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. There is a very real conflict going on here between the Lord and his angels and the devil and his angels. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. They didn't prevail. They were cast out. No place was found for them. So the great dragon was cast out, the servant of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast out to where? The earth and his angels were cast out with him. That tells you clearly that that third of the stars that he took with him were what? Angels. They were cast out with him to this earth. Now, that ought to tell you something. The next time you're faced with something and you uh, don't understand why there seems to be the opposition there, you ought to understand that the devil and his angels are very, very real, you know, and they oppose anything that is of God. They oppose that strongly. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. This has happened. It's come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God's throne day and night has been cast down. The devil and his angel cast out of heaven. The accuser of the brethren are cast out, and they said, Now salvation has come. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of, the t word of their testimony, they did not love their lives to the death. These people that now on earth, you and I, it says the devil is there. He is upset. He has been cast out to the earth. He knows that he's lost the battle. Okay? Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. Now, up, as, up until the time of the death of Christ, the devil had access to other worlds. He had access to the angels. And you can read about it in the book of Job, where you find that the sons of God came before the Lord, and the devil came representing this earth. Okay? But with the death of Jesus Christ, and that's what this is talking about, then his access to other worlds and to the angels stopped. Right there, ended. And when that took place, he had great, great wrath because he knew without question of a doubt when Christ died on the cross, that the victory was won and that he had lost and he knew that was over. And let me tell you, when he did that, it said he came to this earth with great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. And basically what he's saying is take no prisoners. In other words, he's after any individual he can get. And if he can kill them, how much better he is, happier he is because he wants to take no prisoners because he's lost the battle. And that's what this is talking about when it says that he has great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. You see, the war in heaven is, that took place there is not so physical as it is verbal. And you'll find that over and over in the book of Revelation. Revelation 16, verse 3 says, Out of the mouth of the dragon. It, over and over it stresses that. Revelation 1, 16, Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Revelation 12, 10, Accused them before our God. Uh, it's out of the mouth. It's by persuasion. 
You know, if you can persuade somebody, uh, you've gained a great victory if you can persuade them to do something. And that's where the battle is fought, is by the words, persuasion, to get them to go a particular way. If the devil can do anything to persuade you to follow him, not to follow the Lord, he's won the battle. I don't care, I don't care if you go to church, friend, uh, and you go to church every day. If the devil can persuade you not to commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and not surrender to him, he's won the battle. You see, it, it's that that counts. I have to be willing to listen to what the Lord says and to follow it and to follow his counsel and his word. To be persuaded by this book that what it says is truth and that I'll walk in it and follow it and obey it. That's what it takes to enter the kingdom of heaven. Christ speaking of the devil. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He was cast out. Cast out of this earth, fell here, and he is unhappy over that. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, that's talking about God's people. Basically, that has to be your story, that you overcame him, you overcame the dragon, you overcame the devil. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. I have to be fully committed to Jesus Christ. Fully committed. I can't permit anything to come between me and him. Nothing. Says, he that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves brother or husband or wife more than me is not worthy of me. I have to commit my life totally and completely to him. And I overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Have you ever considered what the blood of Christ does for you? What the blood of Christ does for us. You ever just stop to consider what it does? In him we have redemption. How? Through the blood, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You see, it's through the blood of Christ that I have redemption. I don't have redemption through my efforts. I don't have redemption from anybody else. And by the way, there's no one else that offers you redemption, how should I put it, through them. I mean, Buddha doesn't offer it. Confucius doesn't offer it. Muhammad doesn't offer it. They don't offer to you redemption because they died for you. They don't offer that. Jesus Christ died for you. And I have redemption. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's how I'm redeemed. And I need to ever be aware of that. So one, it gives you redemption. Two, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. People say, oh, Brother Cox, I've done too many bad things. Let me tell you. The blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse anything. Amen. Cleanse anything. There's nothing that it can't cleanse. I don't care how dark the sin may be. It can be washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. And you and I need to come to him and let him wash us from our sins in his own blood. Make us white, make us pure, make us clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. 
And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, what? From all sin. Now, it doesn't say from some sins. It says he cleanses us from all sin. In other words, there's just not any sin that Christ can't cleanse you. I'm thankful for that. Thankful that I can be cleansed in his blood. That he died, he paid the price for my sins, and he cleanses us. You see, that's different than anybody else offers. All of the others say, if you do this and this and this, you might make it into the kingdom. You know, if you go out here and, and blow yourself up for Muhammad. Well, he'll give you a special place in his kingdom. Christ doesn't say that. Christ says, come to me. I'll cleanse you. I'll cleanse you of all sin. This, this is the blood of Christ offered for you and for me. Look at this. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. Now, if you don't understand what that's saying, it's saying that God has entered into a covenant with you. And the covenant God's entered in with you is he says, I'll be your God and you be my people. That's his covenant with you. And he said, if you enter into that covenant with me through the blood of Jesus Christ, I will make you complete, okay? I will make you complete in every good work to do his will. You see, change in the human heart does not take place by your strength and your power. Change in the human heart takes place by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It has to work in us and change us and make us different. That takes the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't change your nature. You can't change what you are. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And so I have to come to him and give myself to him and let him do his work in my life. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out, come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That simply means that I need every day to take time, to take time that I have come to him and let him do his work of cleansing on my soul, to keep my robe white, to keep it clean. I must let him do his work in my life. This is what the blood of Jesus Christ will do for you and do for me. And dear friend, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, if you've never given your heart to him, then I would plead with you. Turn your life over to him. Let him take you and wash you, make you clean. He loves you. Now don't misunderstand what I'm saying. He does not love you based on your actions. He loves you just exactly the way you are. He does not say, I'll wash you and then love you. The Scripture doesn't say that. It says he loves us and then washes us. And that's very, very important that he loves us just exactly like we are. So if you come to him, he will take you and wash you and make you clean. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, you have that promise that God gives to you and to me. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were want, once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I'm so thankful for that text because I don't know how you feel, but sometimes, folks, I feel so unworthy so unworthy to come before the Lord. 
I feel like I'd really rather go hide somewhere and all. And I wouldn't even attempt it to come before God and speak to Him and pray to Him if it wasn't because it says, by the blood of Jesus Christ, I have been brought near to God, that I can come before Him because of what Jesus Christ did for me and all. When I stop and consider the majesty of God, the greatness of God, the ruler of the universe, one who spoke and the world came into existence, to even think of approaching his throne, I wouldn't dream of it if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, that he has made the way and has brought us near to God through his blood. Those are wonderful promises that he gives to you and to me. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, thrown out of heaven, cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. You see, the dragon was cast out of heaven, and now that he's cast out of heaven, and, and he can't go back and accuse them over and over that he's confined to this earth, it says he turned his wrath on the woman. That's the church. So if you think that the devil isn't real, you just ought to try preaching the gospel. And it'll tell you real quick, the devil is very, very, very real. Okay. He persecuted the woman, tried to do away with her. You read in history that the pagan Roman Empire turned its wrath upon the church. I mean, you've got to understand, up until to this time Rome had ruled, it had contained the Jewish nation. It didn't let them go anywhere. It kept them contained, confined. They couldn't do anything. But now Jesus came, and he died, and all of a sudden salvation was not contained within the Jewish nation, but was free to every man, woman, and child, no matter whether you were Jew or Greek. It was open to a slave or to anyone who wanted to accept it, and it spread like wildfire across the Roman Empire, and all of a sudden paganism became threatened. And they decided the best thing they could do was to wipe it out. And so they set out to get rid of it. The old devil turned his wrath up on the church. Rome? Oh, Rome didn't care who you worshipped. They didn't care who you worshipped at all. They were polytheistic. They had lots and lots of gods. You could worship any god you wanted. They didn't care if you worshipped Jesus Christ. What they cared about is that in your worship, you worshipped Rome. They had their own goddess. And to make sure that your allegiance was given to Rome once a year, you were required to come in before the magistrate to take a little incense and just simply drop that incense in the fire before this pagan goddess and say, Rome, uh, Dea Roma, and an act of worship to that God. They gave you a certificate, and you go worship anybody you pleased. But the Christians would not do that. You see, their allegiance was to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they did not love their lives unto the death. See, willing to make the supreme sacrifice that they might have the right to worship the Lord. And so these Christians were gathered up, and they were taken in before arenas filled with people and the people stood there in those arenas, and they turned thumbs down on them. 
and lions who hadn't eaten probably in weeks was turned into those arenas and their children and mothers and fathers became food for lions. They gave their lives for the, what they believed, for where they stood. And you can still go to Rome this day, and you can visit the catacombs, and you can walk in those catacombs below the city of Rome, and you can see where they died there by the thousands. I have stood in there. You see those rooms on the side there? There's rooms, folks, that size in there that are totally full of skulls of the people that died, lost their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. They paid the supreme sacrifice because their commitment was to Jesus Christ and they did not love their lives unto the death. But the woman was given wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. Now this period of time here and the one in the sixth verse is both the seven, same. It's talking about the very same period of time. And it says that she, the woman, fled into the wilderness. And so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. He cast out of his mouth a flood of persecution, hoping that the church would be carried away by it. Well, she fled in the wilderness, was there in the wilderness from 538 A.D. to 1798, and he cast out of his mouth through pagan Rome and papal Rome such a flood of persecution that he thought the woman would be wiped out, wiped off the face of the earth, carried away by the flood. And those people had to flee. They had to move out into the mountains in order to be able to worship as they believed that they should, in order to have the freedom to worship. The Bible was taken away from him. But the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. It says the earth helped the woman, swallowed up the flood. Certain events began to take place. Individuals began to stand up and say, this is not right. Papal Rome, the abuse that she placed upon them, they said, no, this is not right. And they stood up. People like Huss and Jerome, Wycliffe, who gave their lives, burned at the stake for the word of their testimony. But they said, this is what we'll do. We will follow the Lord. Out of that movement, that started across the country and across Europe came other individuals like Martin Luther, 1517, translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into German, gave the people a chance to read the Bible in their own language and to understand what it says. Can you sense? I mean, here are people, folks, for a thousand years that have not had access to the Word of God, have not been able to read it, and all of a sudden, here it's made available to them in their own language. And they grabbed it and they read it and they poured over the Scripture. They became so efficient in the Word of God that priests could not put them down in what they had to say. They knew the Word of God better than they did. Out of that rose other people like John Knox, great reformer, through John Knox and John Calvin. You got your Bible. You may not realize that. But these are the men who gave much of what you have in your Bible. You see, they're the ones who translated it 
put it into the language of the people. That became eventually known as the Geneva Bible. It was the Bible of the Reformers. That's the Bible that they preached from, the Word of God, and they held it out to the people as something. Out from that Geneva Bible, much of the King James Version came. That's how it came about. They were great, great preachers of righteousness. That's one way the earth helped the woman. The other way the earth helped the woman was the discovery of the United States. You see, the pilgrims, you know why they were coming over here? Because they were trying to get away from persecution. They wanted to go someplace where they could worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience, according to what the Word of God says. They said, we want a place where we can worship God. And so they came over to this country. I wish today that Christians would do the same thing that was done then. Because as those pilgrims got on the boat and ready to cross the ocean, come here to the United States, their pastor, John Robinson, met with them as they were ready to leave, and they took a commitment from him. And they said, we promise and covet with God and one with another to receive, listen to this, to receive whatever light or truth shall be made known to us from his written word. Before they left, that pastor said to them, before you go, I want you to commit your life that you'll follow the word of God. That whatever you learn that's truth that you'll follow. Oh, that people would do that today. Amen. They would say, yes, I'll follow God's word. Keep it. This was a promise that they made. And that's why the gospel spread in the United States. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who keep the commandments of God have the testimony of Jesus. Right down at the end, today, the last part, the remnant of God's people represented here as a remnant. They keep the commandments of God. Dear friend, God's looking for people that are willing to keep His commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Marvelous promise. You see, you and I can't do anything to add something to salvation. We can't do that. That's all done through the blood of Jesus Christ. Your responsibility and my responsibility is simple to obey. It's what God calls us to do. But it says here that they follow him, keep his commandments, and have the testimony of Jesus. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the what? Testimony, testimony of Jesus Christ. His testimony was there that he was a follower of Jesus Christ, and he stood solidly for him. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. And so tonight, I say to you, how is your testimony? Is your testimony that you love the Lord Jesus Christ? That you stand firm for Him? That you're not going to be moved? That you're going to follow Him, worship Him? Others, do others people see Jesus in you? Oh God, oh dear friends, our testimony should be sure for the Lord that we're going to stand with Him all the way till He comes back. Be faithful as we take a look in the next series at a particular message, three angels' messages that's to be proclaimed to all the world that you and I are to have part in that message in preparing for Jesus to come.
Be faithful. God bless you. Look forward to his coming. Every day, thousands risk their lives to protect and serve their fellow men. They have a deep commitment to excellency and teamwork. And when others run from danger, they run to it. Even if it means personal sacrifice, even if it means making the supreme sacrifice for another, they're always on call, ready to serve no matter what. Friends, you and I can learn a lot from firefighters. In the United States, the majority of them are volunteers. That's right, volunteers. But even for those who are paid, it's more than a job, it's a calling. Jesus said in John 15, verses 12 and 13, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Those who follow the words of Jesus are his friends. But Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing thought. Christ laid down his life for us, even though we were not his friends. A firefighter is willing to do the same. He's constantly preparing for his next mission because his own life and the life of others depends on his training and qualifications. My friends, that's what we're doing right now with this series. We are preparing you for what is to come. Our goal is to make you skilled in the Word so that by the power of God you can bring others to safety the safety that can be found only in the arms of a loving Savior. Won't you help us to train and prepare others to fulfill this mission? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888 888- 747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the second series, Revelations from God's Throne Room, may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series, including Worthy is the Lamb, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, The 144,000, The Seven Trumpets, The Time of the End, The Two Witnesses, and War in Heaven may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.